Hello, Night Owls. I am super excited to be here tonight to talk with you about the best part of every story, and that is villains. Um, I would love to know as we go if you would share in the comments who your favorite villains are and why. What do you love about... Um, what characters do you love that just were really great villains that spoke to you? So tell us that as we go and hopefully I'll cover some that everybody loves. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. I love talking about villains because I feel like a story is only as good as its antagonist. And we'll talk a little bit about those two terms using them interchangeably, but um, there's nothing better than somebody that we love to hate or somebody that we have a visceral reaction to, kind of this physical reaction to. And so I wanna talk about ways that we can incorporate um, different methods in our writing to create better villains. And there are a lot of smart people who have said a lot about villains and some of them have said way better things than I will ever say. But this is kind of what I've noticed over the years of reading really great stories, what people do to keep them interesting and exciting and more meaningful uh, in stories. So first, um, I want you to consider that the best villains aren't pure evil. They're realistic and complex and we identify with them at some level, um, even though they instill fear and conflict. Um, we, we love the bad guys. And if we can identify with them a little bit more, that makes them even better. Uh, some of my favorites are Amy Dunn from Gone Girl. She's got sociopathic tendencies, but we still root for her because we identify with her being so angry and hurt by her cheating husband. Um, President Snow in The Hunger Games, he instills dread and everything that's wrong with the society, but he feels justified in his actions um, because he built this society that works at some level, even though it's barbaric, it maintains order. Um, or there's Misery's Annie Wilkes, and we find her fangirling endearing until it turns creepy and obsessive. But we've all been there at some level, right? Where there's somebody that, that we're super excited and if they ended up in a bed in our house, we might, um, we might do weird things too. I don't know. Um, and then one of my favorites is Matilda. And we'll talk about a different character later. But Miss Trunchbull in Matilda is a very fun villain because she makes you laugh. She makes you feel sorry for her. And you hate her because she targets Matilda. So we have all these complex feelings about the villains in these stories. Um, there's a book I love called Bullies, Bastards, and Bitches, How to Write the Bad Guys of Fiction. And if you're a writer, it's one that you might wanna check out. But she said, it cannot be said too often, antagonists and villains in particular are complicated, three-dimensional and robustly knowable people. After all, it is the process of learning about fascinating characters in terrible difficulties that draws readers in. Readers especially want to learn about what makes a badass tick. So we have these, it's the same with heroes. We wanna know what makes them who they are and, e and a hero is only equal to the villain. So it makes sense that we would need those same kind of building blocks for our villains. Um, so the first point that I wanna cover in creating great villains is an antagonist doesn't have to be evil. So often we use villain and, and antagonist interchangeably um, and bad guy and they're all synonymous, but antagonists are really what's standing in the way of the, the hero getting what they want. So most often that is a villain type um, scenario, but not always, so we'll cover that. Um, but villains don't necessarily have to be evil. They just have to have goals opposite of your main characters. Um, so for the sake of this presentation, I'm using bad guy, villain, and antagonist interchangeably, but it's not always the case. So, um, one of my favorite examples of this, and Christian Bale and Heath Ledger are the only Batman and Joker that I will recognize. Don't even talk to me about um, Ben Affleck as Batman. I, I just won't even go there. But um, they are such a great pair because they have goals opposite of each other. So Batman wants order and Joker wants chaos. The Joker's goals are opposite. That doesn't mean he's necessarily a bad guy. He does some bad things to get there, but they both feel very strongly about these different goals. And they're ne neither of them are bad for the sake of being bad, but both of them have questionable, questionable motives for getting to either chaos or order. Um, so that's what makes them a great pairing. Um, the, 
the Martians, um, Mark Watney wants to go home and Mark, or sorry, Mars just wants to be Mars and suck the life out of all things. So Mars's, Mars's entire makeup is fundamentally opposed to what Watney, our hero, wants in just going home. Um, this is arguably one of the best uh, cartoons of all time, but I think it's a really interesting illustration for those of you who have watched Phineas and Ferb. We have Doofenshmirtz, who is our actual villain, who's in a tower, a villain's tower, always plotting evil things to take over the world. But then we have Candace, who is their sister, who's the one that's always trying to get in the way of the main characters doing what they want. So which one is the villain and which one is the antagonist? Doofenshmirtz is the bad guy, but he's not necessarily interested in what Phineas and Ferb are doing, but Candace is the one actively standing in their way all the time. So I think that they're, um, they're an interesting study on antagonists. But in just about every YA novel you look at, the parents are one of the antagonists because they're grounding the main character or, or giving them rules or keeping them from what they want. But really, they're just being good parents. So you can play around with the antagonists and create strong villains without them being actual villains. Um, the second one is give readers a visceral reaction to your um, to your characters. Uh, Brandon Sanderson, who many of you know, he's an excellent writing teacher. He says, set up your bad guys early by doing something simple, like kicking a puppy. Nobody likes the guy who kicks the puppy. Um, I, the perfect example of this is Darth Vader, where his character debuts to him entering a scene in a cloud of smoke, walking through a pile of dead bodies. You don't get more clear villain than that. Um, Another one is Dolores Umbridge. She shows her sadistic tendencies over and over and over again. Um, but we see this first when Harry has his first detention and she forces Harry to write using his own blood for hours at a time uh, with he's in pain, he doesn't get any breaks and she takes pleasure in this pain that she's causing him. And one I think is the very best example is Pennywise from either it the movie or the book but he's a great example because his character is literally designed around the visceral reaction so clowns are pretty creepy on their own but he shifts into each person's worst fear creating that palpable fear in the child and the reader so we see him morph into these things that people will have a physical and emotional reaction to um the third one is give give them believable motives. Uh, there's a lot of these that I really love um, when they have a good backstory. Um, the first one is obviously Professor Snape. Um, we, he hates Harry because of the, his past with Harry's parents. He was bullied, he felt wronged. And occasionally we ca catch glimpses of his actions being justifiable. We feel for him and understand why he would hate Harry. Um, but he's such a great character because we find ourselves wanting to give him the benefit of the doubt, even while hating him for how he, he treats our beloved protagonist. And then in the end, he redeems himself and, and we all love him in the end. But even going up to that point before we know what's actually happening um, with Snape, we love him and feel conflicted about him because we understand um, what his motives are and why he feels the way he does toward Harry. Um, and really, as I was thinking about it, any Alan Rickman movie ever, he's always the best villain, um, whether it's Quigley Down Under or um, Die Hard or Prince of Thieves, he's always this amazing villain. So I feel like all of us should just go do a character study on villains by watching all of the Alan Rickman um, villain shows. Um, and another one I really like is Thanos. Um, Sorry, watching for text. Okay, um, Thanos I think is really interesting because he's not really emotionally driven. He There's some times when he gets angry or he responds um, emotionally, but most of the time he's very logical. He feels like the world is overpopulated. It's not sustainable. He has a solid method for taking care of that. End of discussion. He doesn't. He doesn't bring in a lot of emotion, and um, his motives are believable. I don't feel like any of us have ever not had a time when we've thought 
you know, maybe, maybe there's something to what he's saying. Maybe we are overpopulated. Maybe there does has to be, have to be something drastic. So I think he's a really interesting one because he's not really inherently bad. He's trying to solve a problem for humankind. And, um, and he's very logical about how he goes about that. Uh, the fourth one, <clears throat> make them relatable. Uh, villains are so much stronger when we understand why they're doing what they're doing, even if we don't like them. I, I don't know anybody that loves Thanos, but we understand why he's doing what they're doing. One of my very favorite villains of all time is Cersei Lannister from the Game of Thrones, the series. I haven't read the books, but I love her in the series because she's kind of a horrible person. She does horrible things all the time. There's no getting around that. But she's also a good mother. She's loyal and defends her kids at any cost. She will do anything for them, even if they're little monsters like Joffrey. Um, she's also a woman who's smart and capable, but the men around her are always putting her in her place or, um, or trying to make her be something um, that she's much more qualified for. And she's sold off to marriages, she's ridiculed. Um, no matter how hard she works to get ahead, it never quite works out for her. And as a reader or viewer, I love her because I can relate to her feelings. Um, if not the way she acts on them, I understand why she's the way she is and I like her for it. Um, another one, I think this kind of goes along with the motherhood theme, but um, the Raven in Red from City of Ghosts um, is a woman who lost her child and she's out looking for her child. And when she can't find them, she takes other other uh, children. And this is also um, the myth of, I always say, Lorna, or I don't know, I don't speak Lorna, but um, the, the myth of the woman who drowns her children and then goes looking for them in the river at night, just mourning them and, and missing them and trying to find them. And when she can't, she takes down other, other people's children. So we can relate to that. As a mother, I can relate to that. And that makes me identify with those villains. Um, a couple of others are Cardin from the Cruel, Prin Cruel Prince. Um, he's complicated because we, we, he's also the love interest, but he's, he's a villain. He's not a good guy. But then we kind of see as the story goes, how his, um, his upbringing, how, his, how he was abused and mistreated and how that kind of created the person that he is. And Megamind, who grew up in a prison, what do we expect him to turn out like? Um, so having these little bits of us being able to relate to them, make them really interesting and complex and fun characters. The fifth one is kind of related, but a little bit different. Make them likable. Um, not everyone who's relatable is also likable. Um, for example, <laughs> I don't know any of, if any of you have seen this movie, but um, Cold Pursuit, it's a very Liam Neeson movie, revenge thriller. It's very rated R, so if that bothers you, don't watch it. But um, this um, this character Viking is one of my favorite characters and favorite villains in a long time. One, because he has his strict moral code. He calls people out on lying or cheating or going behind people's backs. He believes in a moral code, but he's also awful. He's racist. He's um, he kills people at the drop of a hat. He's not a good guy, um, but we see him have this moral code and he has this son that he loves and he tries to protect and he's overbearing, but he's trying to do what's best for them and trying to see and kind of seeing him balance those two things in a bad guy. It makes him like, he's very funny and he's, he's witty and um, he's a way more interesting character than the Liam Neeson one. So he's a fun antagonist to have in the story. Um, Another one is Loki. Why do we like Loki so much? I don't know. I think a lot of it is um, we never know what is going to happen next. We never know what he's going to do. Um, he, he, um, is he gonna turn on Thor? Does he have a secret plan to help him out? We never know until it happens. Um, I think he's so likable because we see his character arc arc we see how much he's grown and developed in the story and we see him evolve from somebody who's bitter and narcissistic and wants to take over to someone who genuinely realizes that he likes his brother and wants to be be more than just a villain and so he has a great um, character arc and makes him a really fun villain another one that i love that i think is so likable is Gollum. um 
we we like him because he used to be just a cute little hobbit and we feel sorry for him we feel pity for him but also he's adorable he looks like a little kid he has these childlike reactions to things uh he throws these little temper tantrums he's sneaky and naughty he's never just malicious and evil he's just a little bit naughty so we're torn and we see him be torn between wanting to be good and wanting to help the hobbits and um, wanting to get the ring at any cost. So he's he's a fun villain and we're rooting for him almost as much as we are the hero throughout the story. Um, the next one, number six, villains can be internal or external. Um, So I think this is a really interesting one because we often think of villains as the bad guy, right? But they don't have to be. They can be our own internal um, issues and they can be different factors besides people that are external. So one of my favorite examples is Tangled. Um, I love the scene with Rapunzel. You can see the scene where she's rolling through the grass and she feels grass for the first time and she's so happy and she goes back and forth between singing and full of joy and arguing with herself about how much her trouble she's going to be in and how she's betraying her mother so she's very back and forth and a lot of those um internal struggles her fighting against herself versus the external um joy of just being out of the tower for the first time are so fun to watch um so she she's kind of her own villain until she figures out what's actually happening in the story um, another one this is one of my favorite stories i it's a shorter story, but I feel like every writer should read it because it's so great at showing internal and external um, conflict at the same time. Um, it, the The premise is that um, every every year or two, I can't remember the it's been a while, but all these boys go on a walk, and the only goal is to be the last one standing. If you fall, if you get too slow, there's um, tanks behind you that will shoot you. And if you, um, you just have to keep walking, that's all you do. And it doesn't sound complicated, but your body starts to break down, your mind starts to break down, you're watching other people beside you fall or get shot. So there's so many different um, villains in this story. You've got your own mental struggles, you've got, um, you've got the people beside you that are your competition, you've got the, the system, whatever that is, they don't go into that a lot that is driving you to finish this walk. So there's a lot of great conflict in this story in such a simple, simple premise. So the villain can be something internal or external. It can be something that is tangible, not tangible. And um, it makes for a really interesting story. And one of my favorite villains ever is um, Jack Torrance because his villains are all internal, right? There's the hauntedness of the hotel. There's what's drawing him to that point, but really it's he becomes the villain because he's fighting with his own interior villains he's he's fighting with his own voices in his head and and then he becomes the villain for his family so i think even it's even interesting that different people within the same story have different perspectives of who the villain is and why um but i i think um, it's a really interesting example of what's going inside his head creating that villain um Okay, I, I have some comments from Carrie that I'm going to read. Um, she says, um, Olivia says, I didn't even know the last one needed slides because I joined late. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. I'm glad I tricked you. Um, Darby says, Professor Snape is her favorite. Agreed. Olivia says, The Joker. Agreed. Darby says, Sheriff of Nottingham in that terrible Robin Hood movie with Kevin Costner. So good, right? And his death scene is just my favorite thing ever. Uh, and Darby says, the entire cast of Game of Thrones. That's an excellent point. There's no real heroes in the Game of Thrones. Um, I mean, there's arguably Jon Snow, but most of them are just really complicated characters. They, they do good things, they do terrible things, and you're not sure who to root for. And that's what makes that show so well done. Uh, until the last season, but so well done is because everybody is kind of their own, kind of a villain in their own way. Um, Darby says Annie Wilkes freaks me out. Something fierce. Agreed. Kelly Hager knows why. Um, Olivia says, "Oh, I feel like Trunchbull is the villain in Matilda. Definitely." Um, 
<laughs> Darby says Liam Neeson is the man. Jennifer Bardley says great examples. Thank you. Olivia says Loki is an awesome character and he's Tom Hiddleston. Yes, exactly. Some characters, they just are that person, right? Um, okay, so number seven, villains don't have to be people. Um, we've talked about Mars being the villain in The Martian. There's nothing standing between him like a monster it's mars it's the environment and we've talked about in um in the hunger games how it's the establishment right it's it's president snow but it's also just the society and i would say that with a lot of um like a post-apocalyptic and even contemporary um issues that we're facing with racism and justice and all kinds of things, a lot of times it's the system that is the villain. It's these set rules that we're, we're fighting against and trying to survive against. Um, but it can also be an animal. It could be um, sharks. I think there's very, very few movies that do a better animal villain than Jaws um, does or Jurassic Park is one of my all-time favorite books and movies I'm um, just the the dinosaurs as these villains and it's fun too because you have com the complexity of some of the people being bad but but the big bad is the dinosaurs and all of the people kind of trying to survive that and snakes on a plane or anaconda there's a lot of kind of silly ones, but it's interesting to see how nature, um, especially animals can be, uh, can be the bad guy. Um, and going along with the nature aspect, um, Everest, I don't know if you've seen that one, but that one was very hard to watch. Uh, the Perfect Storm, Castaway, all of these are nature as the villain. And um, they're a lot of fun because, um, because they're not what we expect they're not they're not something specifically a bad guy with a motive fighting against them it's just how the world is and they're trying to survive um so the villain can be technology something supernatural or any number of things if you google narrative conflicts you can see or man versus whatever there's seven different types of um, villains that aren't human so they're a lot of fun to play around with in different types of stories um, number eight, give villains their own arcs with motives, wants, and needs. We've talked a little bit about this, but um, sorry, children. Um, I feel like there's been a trend over the last, I don't know, maybe 10 years, giving all the villains their remakes. They um, are giving them complicated backstories and kind of justifying why they are the way they are. Um, and we understand them more and it gives them their own story. I think they're a lot of fun. Um, Joker, I think this movie is really, really well done. He's no Heath Ledger, but he's way better than Jared Leto. Um, but just giving him kind of his buildup of why he's the way he is and why he wants why he's so hellbent on chaos over uh over the order that batman wants maleficent we see why she feels slighted by this party that we're used to seeing in the um sleeping beauty growing up heartless gives the queen of hearts her backstory and then president snow gets his own backstory so there's a trend to kind of um, humanize the villains and let us see who they really are and why they're the way they are and um, two of my very favorites are, um, I talked about Cersei before on this podcast, but um, she's fun because she was, she was the villain in the Odyssey. She turned men into pigs. She um, was a witch. She did all these awful things. But when you read this book, it's a fabulous book. It's one of my favorites, but it talks about why she does those things um they're they're not just innocent men doing what they're doing she's doing she's turning them to pigs for a reason and so seeing those old myths and legends that we've heard before and then giving them new life with um, a villain who has a different character arc and a backstory is a really fun interesting way to do it and then um recently castle rock on netflix i didn't love the first season so if you're gonna watch it i would say skip the first season but second season is the origin story of annie wilkes from misery and i thought it was so well done and so amazing and it completely plays into the film version of um misery why she's the way she is why she's obsessive about this author why she is kind of not all there so i think these ones are so well done and like i said these have kind of been done to death giving the the villains an origin story but 
what we like is morally gray characters. Um, we like knowing that everybody's not perfect like Superman, that there's complicated reasons that people become the way they are. Um, and when there's a great villain versus a great hero, these are the kind of stories that make the best reading or viewing. Um, I, I like to think of it as um, the saying, one man's trash is another man's treasure, which isn't very nice about humans. But I feel like when we identify with people who have the same flaws that maybe we have, then it makes it really fun and makes the story come alive for us. Uh, the final one is, let me see is um yes elena is it elena elena says the best villains always believe they are really the hero in their own minds exactly well said thank you for saying that um shannon says what about an antagonist who wants the same goal as the protagonist that's an interesting question um so maybe they just have a different way of getting to that to that goal or um maybe only one of them can attain it or um, something like that. I, one, of, um, one of my favorite examples of conflict that I've used before is um, the TV series, The Bachelor, because I think that's a perfect example of villains and conflict and antagonists because these are all probably very nice girls, more or less, but they all want the same thing. And so that's what kind of turns them against each other when he kisses one of them and not the other, or when they all want the same guy, but he responds differently to each of them. It turns them into different types of antagonists, um, both internally and externally, because they want the same things. Um, and neither of them are right or wrong they just become each other's villains so i don't know if that exactly answers what you're what you're asking but i think i think that happens a lot where if people want the same thing but have a different way of getting to that to it or if they have to fight each other to get what they want then um, it brings out good conflict and creates good heroes and villains um Number nine, good or bad, let them own it. So we talked about having an arc, but also sometimes just let people be bad. They don't always have to have, um, like you as a writer should know their backstory, but also every every evil person doesn't need to be justified. Um, one of my, a, a good example of this I think is um, Ted, Ted Bundy, the serial killer because he had a he had a good background he had a good family life his parents loved him he just said i just wanted to do it like i just wanted to be bad and um sometimes you'll have those kind of villains and those are really interesting too because there's no there's no method to their madness it's just what they want and so i think those can make great stories too um one of the examples okay don't don't hate me because i feel like keith cliff has become this romantic hero and i love this book it's one of my favorites but and he has a sympathetic background we know why he acts the way he does he's had a hard childhood um his uh, he's got this undying love for Catherine but in the second half of the novel he's a man driven by revenge he's bitter and mean and um he tries to gain control by manipulating those around them so by the end of the novel he has chosen to be a villain and um i don't know we can fight about that but i feel like he's somebody who's just owns it this is who i am this is who i'm going to be and um and that's who he becomes in the story um we've talked about we talked about miss trunchbull as the villain and she ab absolutely is um I love Mr. Wormwood because he's just a jerk. He, he's funny um, and I don't know, you kind of like him because he's funny and quirky and weird and he's not evil, but he, he lies, he cheats over and over and over again. He never learns from his mistakes. And ultimately he decides it's less pressure not to have his smart, adorable, wonderful child around and um, be adopted by somebody else. So he's somebody who's never a good guy. He never learns anything. There's never a character arc, but he owns it and he's completely unapologetic about it. Um, we don't like him or root for him or understand him, um, but he's an excellent villain for the ways he contrasts Matilda and makes us fall in love with her. Um, so as we said in the beginning, multidimensional villains are just as important as any other aspect of our stories. Um, otherwise we have a flat, 
fairy tale archetype of black and white, good and evil. Um, if villains lack depth, we take away the emotional impact that they have on readers and we make them caricatures instead of interesting and believable themes. So by creating smart, believable, occasionally sympathetic antagonists, we create more compassion for our main character um, because we force them to be a better hero in order to beat the forces against them. Uh, a, a great antagonist will up the game of the entire story. It'll make the hero better. It'll make the conflict better. Everything will be better if you have a really great complex um, villain. Um, though, though there are many different types of antagonists, the good ones succeed because they create a physical or emotional response and we understand what drives them. Um, I love this quote by Ellen Montgomery, Anne of the Island. If I had to have villains at all, I'd give them a chance. I'd give them a chance. There are some terrible bad men in the world, I suppose, but you'd have to go a long piece to find them. Most of us have got a little decency somewhere in us. And I love that quote. And I just wanted to end on that because I feel like um, if you have any last questions or comments, type them in um, as I wrap up, Carrie will send them over. But um, I think I have a big family. And so I, not that any of them are villains, but I think about um, there, I have eight, eight siblings, I have parents and they all want, they all have such different personalities and want such different things. And in any given situation, um, I don't think any of us are villains or bad people, but we want different things and that creates tension and conflict. And um, and that's what makes good stories. Nobody reads a story um, that's just nice people doing nice things all the time. And um, so we're all decent people. Villains, a lot of times are decent people, um, but finding those little bits of, um, being likable or relatable or um, pushing the boundaries of what makes a villain against a hero um, can go a long way in giving your writing depth and making your characters really interesting. So I would love to hear if anyone else has um, favorite villains that they would like to share. Um, I've shared a bunch of mine tonight. So tell us what you like, um, who you love and what you like about them and what makes them unique and interesting to you. Um, and I just want to give a plug for our book of the month this year or this month. Oh, sorry. Um, we do this every month. Those of you who are regulars know that um, every every month we do a 99 cent ebook and we talk about it at the end of the month. This month I'm so excited because as many of you know, um, the Poppy and the Rose is about the Titanic. And it's a dual timeline and historical um, part, historical part contemporary, but um, it takes place on the Titanic. And this month is the anniversary of the date of the Titanic um, sinking. So Ashley has um, have has a fun idea planned for untold stories of the Titanic that we're going to be doing on April fifteenth. So. Um, read the book. It's so fabulous and so fun. And um, we're excited to talk about the Titanic and look at look at the sad, um, sad aspects of it. Not not always sensationalize it, but look at some of the people and, and how this tragedy impacted them. So we're excited about that. And also next week, Carrie is going to be talking about um, Carrie's our PR and publicity person. And she's going to be talking about visibility as an author and things that you can do to to kind of up your game and be more visible. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I know that um, you have, I don't know, what do they say at McDonald's? Do you have other options? And I appreciate you choosing us. But anyway, thank you for being here tonight. And we. I hope that it's been helpful. And I look forward to reading your comments and seeing you next week. Thank you and have a great night. Subscribe to our channel so you'll never miss an upload or join us live every Thursday for author interviews, book clubs, writing advice, and more on Facebook at Owl Hollow Press, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. See you Thursday.